And that's a big part of what the Lord is starting to show us at this church. I thank God for what he's done. And uh, let's just go ahead and get started. Listen, uh, what I plan to do tonight is I'm going to read through the whole chapter of chapter 18. I got some uh, some some slides to kind of to show you. And uh, th this is the ESV version. I, my favorite is the King James. You know, well, okay, well then why preach you? Why did you quit reading out the King James? I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes I feel like I'm up here translating the old words out of the old English. I, if I'm going to read, I like reading the King James. I'm still going to read to you the King James. I'm not opposed to that. We're still going to have to go to the King James. Sometimes we'll look up words on the, on the in Strong's and whatnot. But, you know, I will always stick to literal translations. I compare what other things have to say. But uh, I always stick to a literal translation. The ESV is a literal translation. I like the NASB too. Anyway, here we go. That's a quick little explanation. All right. After this, I said, now, and what is after this? Just real quick, you got to be reminded. What happened in chapter 17? In chapter 17, we were introduced to a harlot. Some translations call it. Uh, some translations call it, said it was the whore. Um, and basically, we're, it, this is still continuing on, and I'm going to prove that to you. I counted, I think, 35 times, and you'll see it when I'm reading. <coughs> I highlighted in pink the times that hurt the pronoun he or she, a couple of times when the word queen was used, one time when the word widow was used. It's all talking about that same harlot that was in chapter 17. So this is just a continuation, but it's just looking at a different aspect of it. All right, and basically what it was is she was riding the, the, this beast, and we already know that the beast is, we've already taught here anyway, that the beast is both a system and ultimately will be fulfilled in the fact that it will be a person which will be a counterfeit of Jesus, which is also known as the Antichrist. And that, that seven-headed beast were nations that have been against God, biblical nations mentioned in the Bible. Daniel said, Daniel told us about Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. There will be another that comes after Rome. Okay, that's a ten-horned confederation. And from there, the Antichrist kingdom will come. The two before that were Egypt and Assyria, which were already fallen when Daniel prophesied. And so that's the se that's the seven-headed beast. It's these governments. So basically, real quick, I'm just going to let you know that the, when it's all said and done, that the beast is made up of both false, I'm not even going to call it false religion. I, I, see, listen, every time I study, every time I ponder, every time I meditate on the Word of God, I feel like, and you may not even agree with all my stuff, but I'm good with it. I already know that. But I feel like the Lord gives me another level. And I'm not even calling it false religion anymore. I'm not calling it false doctrine anymore. I'm calling it Satan's magic. Now listen to me. That's just a fast way for me to describe all the stuff bumping around in my head. What are you talking about? Satan's magic. Listen, false doctrine casts a spell over people. False religion casts a spell over people. The Bible teaches us in Revelation chapter 17 that the inhabitants of the earth had been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. False religion, false doctrine. It's like a magical spell. Paul said in the, to the Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Had you started it, basically his idea was, had you started in the spirit, and now you're going to be made perfect in the flesh. That means the same way you start the race is the same way you finish the race. How did you start it? Faith in Christ and what he did for you at the cross. That's how you were introduced to the faith. How are you going to continue to live for the Lord? Yes. Faith in Christ and what he did for you at the cross because he hits the song. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Right? right. He is risen. See, there's resurrection power in Jesus. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Without the cross, there is no resurrection. Right. Amen. The cross represents the death side of Calvary. Calvary, death of the old man born like Adam. The resurrection celebrates the life side of Calvary. The new man resurrected in Christ that has access to the grace of God to empower him and strengthen him. Why? Why do you need to be empowered yeah. and strengthened? Having gotten into the word yet that we're going to read tonight, but why do you need to be empowered and strengthened? So that you can be live a better life, be a mom, a better, a better mom, a better dad, a better pastor, a better 
music leader, a better a better business owner. Uh, yeah, it's all those things. But but listen, it's because God wants you in victory. You know why God wants you in victory? Because if you're in bondage, guess what? You ain't telling nobody about Jesus. See, I need you to understand something. God's got work going on on this earth, and we're about to talk about this. And listen, He's got some rebels against it. Is God bigger than the rebels? Absolutely. But do you understand that the enemy is wreaking havoc and destruction? If people are having sex on altars in Mexico and God only knows what's going on in Kenya, Lord, help us. Right. Amen? And that's what's going on out there. But if you and I are bound up by sin, and I'm talking about all of us, how are we going to function and accomplish on earth what God wants us to do? Because we're just so caught up. And, self, and selfish minded. You know, that's another thing, and I'm not shrinking back from this. I was having a conversation. Robert sent me to go speak to a lady about Ruth today, and I'm glad I did, because guess what? She started, she, I don't know, I was nowhere. We started talking about the gospel. And she's like, well, what about all these churches? And what about these people that are going to the church up the road? And all this kind of stuff like that. And, I, and you know, it just opened up a door, because guess what? There's, there's this movement in the church, in the modern church. That everything is supposed to be relevant and focused on self. And, 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 and if you're not telling me what I want to hear, people are moving on down the road. And I just want to, I just want you to know something that 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 God is doing work on the earth. Amen. And that's not, yes, it was all about you when he died on Calvary Street. It was. He had you on his mind. I know there's a song somewhere. He had you, he had you on his mind. But can I tell you something? It ain't all about you. No, as a matter of fact, it's all about Jesus. Amen. That's and it's right. all Amen. about the work that the Father right. is it. doing. Amen. Praise God. All right. So here we go. We're going to read about how society, this harlot, these governments, the financial system. That's what we're reading about today, the financial system. So again, this beast is made up of harlotry. She's Satan's magic. That's how I'm going to call it. False doctrine, false religion. The seven-headed beast, which is the governments of the world and the leaders of the world that have been against God. If I can sit here and quote to you all the scripture that back that up, we have I have here for hours. Okay? And the financial, financial Babylon. That's what we're talking about. The beast system. I've already tried to introduce you to this idea. We're not when we talk about Babylon today, we're not talking about a geographical location. Some people in commentaries have said that. That's what we're, about. we're not talking about a physical city. We're talking about something spiritual. I'm going to prove it to you. Amen. All right. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. He called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Thirty-five times this female pronoun is used. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird. I, I had a couple of scriptures here, but I know I'm not going to have time, so I'm just going to tell you about them. I saw my little thing I got there. It's a whole note section right there. I just want to tell you that birds and the fowl have been descriptive of demon spirits in many different ways. When Abraham cut covenant with God and fell asleep under the tree, what happened? The fowl of the air tried to destroy the carcasses of the sacrifice. The fowl of the air are always trying to destroy the work of God. What happens when the Seed goes forth. Y'all remember the parable of the sower? What's the first thing that happens? Seed that's thrown along the wayside. What happens? The fowl of the air. Later, Jesus interprets the parable. Who does he say the fowl are? He says Satan. Satan and his demons and his fallen and the works of evil are the ones that come to steal the seed of the word so that you would, so that human beings can't receive it and be saved. And have hope. So there you go, bird. A haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Listen, this is language that the that the Bible writers are using. This is what the Holy Spirit told John to write. He's describing this harlot, this away. The, they, they've been drunk. They, they said the same thing in chapter 17. He wants us to get this. That for all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. The kings of the earth have committed immorality with her. And the merchants, look at that. that now, that's interesting because we're, I told you we're talking about financial Babylon. The merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, 
Come out of her, my people. And I do want to. I do want to take a quick uh, gander at this right here. Like this is verse what again? I don't even know where I got that. <laughs> verse four right here. Let's take a look at this. This is John chapter seventeen. I just preached on this a couple weeks ago. This is the prayer that the Lord prayed before He was about to go. To, you know, He knew He was going to the cross. Uh, he says, "I have given them Your word, and the world has hated them." Because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the yes. world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the wor world. Sanctify them. That's if you listen, the word sanctify, yes, it needs to be made holy. But it's talking about being separated out. You and I as believers, when we get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live in our heart. That's already a separation point. But it's the word of God that gives us the compass of what is God's will upon this wicked world that we live within. And it's the word of God along with the Holy Spirit that will teach us and enculturate us to the culture of God. And will show us how we are to be separated from this evil, wicked world that we live in. With them. I hope that makes sense. Sanctify them in, in truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. So I wanted you to see that. It, you know, we're not of the world, but we are in the world, right? And so this is what they this is what John says. Same writer, by the way, so that's pretty powerful. We're not going to get into why that's important Bible study-wise. I've talked about it before, but listen. Many times the same Bible authors use same typical concepts because it's what's in their heart and the Lord sees what's in there and he pulls it out. That's another story that's called plenary inspiration, but we're not going to talk about that right now. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her. That's the point I wanted to make when I went to John. Jesus said, don't take them out of the world. They're not of the world, but I'm not asking you to take them out. Just like I'm out of the world, but just as you sent me into the world, though I send them into the world, right? Because, see, God has a mission to be accomplished on this earth. Amen? Because people that you work with and people that you see at Walmart and people that, wherever you go, there are people that are dead. In, meaning they don't have a life in Christ. There's people in Kenya. There's people in Mexico. There's people all over this world that, that don't know the Lord. Amen? And so God's not going to pull us out, but what, what he's saying is come out of her. What, what does he mean? Separate yourself from the harlot. We're going to get into, and this is some deep thought now. There's some very abstract thought connected to who she is, who this city is, and all of that. Okay, but he's saying you need to come out of her. Now, what does that mean to you? I mean, does that mean that you can't go to Walmart because they might play secular music on the radio? That's not what it means to me. You know, does that mean that you got to walk through, you know, be like, la, 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 la. That's not what it means to me. But it probably does mean that you ought to not be feeding yourself with the stuff of the world. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? It does mean that there's a separation and that God's will will be revealed to you by His Spirit. And that He wants you, by His grace, to remove yourself from her. Alright? Remove yourself. Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins. Lest you share in her plagues. This woman got some plagues coming her way. For her sins are heaped up high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others. Boy, there's a lot that can be said about that. My brain just bumps along. Like all of the stuff that we've heard recently about pedophilia, and even if you don't even believe all that, all that, the other stuff connected to the occult world. We're going to get into that a little bit. But this whole Jeffrey Epstein and this island thing and all this pedophilia. I'm, that's not accidental, man. Right? You, you can go back to sleep if that's what you want to do. Close your little eyes and, and go back to sleep. Rub the rust off your eyes. Why you say rust instead of crust? Because, dude, our eyes been closed so shut. It's like they've been welded. And then they got to lay a rust on the top of them. And, you know, no, we got to take a grind with our eyes. We're so blind right now, we couldn't see nothing to save ourselves. Listen, this world is so wicked and so full. And it just, it's just hidden. And look, whenever you, you're, uh, you're in the midst of escapism, that's kind of what it's talking about. That you've been made drunk 
with the wine of her fornication. It's pouring over into everybody, man. I'm telling you right now, I realize now how I got saved when I was 19, dude. I was so blind until I heard Brother Swagger talking about what he was talking about on the radio about being baptized in the Christ. Hallelujah. Then my eyes were open. Then I was able, once I understood Romans 6, to be able to understand the whole Bible. Call it what you want. But until I understood what that meant, I, did, I read the Bible. I couldn't understand. Then now I'm seeing things. I just, and I, I got to talk about it because it's in the Bible. All right? And I want to understand the Bible. And some things are harder to understand than others. But you showed up at this church, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to go through the Bible and we're going to learn it. And some stuff is like not even, listen, there's even people that I love and respect very much. They ain't going to agree with my interpretation on some of this. But, I'm, but this is what I'm seeing in the way I'm not going to strike back. I'm going to do what I feel like God's calling me to do. Look, she paid back others and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed that she glorified herself and lived in luxury. So give her a like measure of torment and mourning. Since in her heart she says, I sit as a queen. I am no widow. That comes straight out of Isaiah 47 right there. And more, it's talking about Babylon, interesting enough. Now that was a physical, geographical Babylon. And listen. There's terminology in Isaiah 14 that speak, is, is talking about the prince of, of Babylon, but then all of a sudden it starts talking about, you can tell it's talking about Lucifer or Satan. It's like, what's going on here? That can't be human. It's because it's the same story. Just as the Holy Spirit finds vessels like you, like me, to live in, he uses our mouths, he uses our feet, he uses our hand to bring the good news of the gospel. I'm here to tell you, the enemy fills himself up with liars. And sometimes they're like little minions, but sometimes they're like powerful, powerful people. And he is getting his work done on the earth. I hate to tell you, my friend, he's working harder than most people in the church. Come on. It's just reality. And, and most of us, we're so tired. And listen, I'm tired, too. We're so tired. But anyway, Lord, help us. Let me not take that many times, because I'm tired. Says, I am no widow. She says, I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. For this reason, her plagues will come in a single day. All this is in Isaiah 47. Death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire. For mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. And the kings of the earth... Who committed sexual... And now listen, what is a king? A king is a leader of a kingdom. They had kings back in the old days. They still got a, maybe one or two, maybe a few kings, a handful of kings today in other countries that we're not familiar with. But guess what? Presidents could beat the term. You understand that? It's a leader of a nation. The point that I'm trying to make to you is the Bible is telling us leaders of nations have been in bed with this harlot. <laughs> And this harlot is committing, is like connected to sorcery. She's connected to Satan's magic. It's, I didn't make this up. We're not even done yet. It's going to tell it to us. Who committed sexual immorality and they lived in luxury. This is not a real woman right here. You understand? This right, is a spiritual right. entity that we're talking about. Will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in fear and of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city. See, that's what she is. She's the great city. <clears throat> you mighty city Babylon. For in a single hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her. Since no one buys their cargo anymore. You see that? That's talking about commerce. Merchants and commerce and cargo and the buying and selling of goods and the making of money. Cargo of gold and silver and jewels and pearls and fine linen and purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wool, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat. Cattle and sheep, horses and chariots and slaves, that is, human souls, the fruit for which your soul long. Before I keep going, I mean, can you not see that the Bible writer, that the Holy Spirit wants the Bible writer to inform the Bible reader that the world, leaders of the world, 
have been made drunk with this woman and that all commerce and all of this stuff, that there's some type of, at least we could say, some type of interconnection between evil and between the what's going to happen in the end days is all going to be revealed and it's going to be destroyed. And somehow God is, is showing us that there was an interconnection between the powerful people of the earth and this satanic call. Your soul alone has gone from you and all your delicacies and your splendors are lost to you, never to be found again. The merchants of these wares or these goods who gained wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud. Can you imagine that? The richest people on the face of the earth. There's gonna, this is coming, my friend. This is going to happen. This isn't some fairy tale. I believe it with all my heart. God's going to bring an end to it. God's going to bring an end to it. All the wickedness. All of the wicked finances. Are you saying money's evil? No, it's the love of money. It's the, it's the way that the enemy has taught man to use money to hold people in subjection and bondage. It's the power that men wield that hold human souls in bondage right, that's behind right. it. It's the, it's the greed connected to it and the way that they can hold mankind in slavery. That's the problem. And God sees it all. Alas, alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet adorned with gold. Is it a sin to have a gold ring? Come on, man. You, you, look, come on. Is it a sin to drive a big truck? Come on. No. The point is, is that this world is corrupt. But there is scriptural talk about us getting caught up in this and how it will pull us away. Right. Gold with jewels and with pearls. I mean, you get the point, right? We're not even done with the chapters like they're wearing us out with this. For in a single hour, all this wealth has been laid waste. All the shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors and all whose trade is on the sea, stood far off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads as they wept and mourned, crying out, Alas, alas, for the great city, where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth. For in a single hour she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets. For God has given judgment for you. For you, saints and prophets. He gave judgment for you against her. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. And the sound of harpists and musicians, of flute players and trumpeters will be heard in you no more. And a craftsman of any craft will be found in you no more. And the sound of the mill, talking about milling out rice and grain, agriculture, harvest time, will be sounded and heard in you no more. The light of a lamp will shine in you no more. The voice, this is big, we'll get into this a little bit more. Of the bridegroom and bride. That's sad. If you, can, if you catch that already, I'm going to make sure you understand that before we leave. That's sad. And the voice of bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants were the great ones of the earth, and all nations were deceived by your sorcery, and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints. And of all who have been slain on the earth. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. I pray, O oh Lord God, that you would help us to see what you desire us to see, O oh Lord God, in your word tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So let's see. Let me get started on this. So, what is this city, Mystery Babylon? And you know, we already talked about some of this. 
already. I've tried to prepare for you to make the point that this is not a geographical location. Many of men of God have said that. Many men are probably smarter than me. I'm not seeing it. Babylon doesn't have to be rebuilt. So I've already told about this. Saddam Hussein tried to rebuild the gate of Ishtar. He's done. He's gone. This is not a rebuilding of any kind of a geographical location. This is here now. This has been here, my friend. And guess what? The Lord is going to bring it to destruction. We're going to open it up. False religion. I'm, I told you I, I didn't have time to change this. It's really Satan's magic is what I'm trying to tell you. All manner of false religion, whether it be Buddhism, whether it be Islam, whether it be Hinduism, whether it be Krishna, whether it be Jehovah Witnessism, whether it be Mormonism, whether it be false doctrine behind pulpits and Protestant churches. See, the Holy Spirit don't ever tell a lie, my friend. Now, it's one thing if a preacher misinterprets the scripture and accidentally presents it improperly and next year he might understand it differently and he corrects his doctrine or whatever. But listen, whenever a person is lying or not telling the whole truth because it's uncomfortable or he feels like he needs to protect people from the truth of what's in the word of God, that don't fly with the Lord, my friend. Because see, this is his word and he said, present our word for the way it's written. He wants the, the worker to rightly divide the word of God and to present the word of God to his people. And some people are like, well, they're not really ready for all that giant stuff. Hold on a second. The Lord put it in the word. The Lord put it in his word. Amen. And who am I? am I? Am I supposed to decide what you're ready for? No. That's why we probably got 150 people in here tonight. Because not everybody's ready to hear all. All right, false religion. This is the harlot. She's riding the back of the beast. The seven-headed beast is those nations that we already talked about. Egypt, Assyria, uh, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome. From Rome will come a revitalized Roman Empire, the ten-horned nations. And those nations will give their power to the beast for a season. Seven heads. She rides the, these kings now we're talking about financial Babylon, all right? We're talking about financial Babylon. So this is it's kind of like a weird thing. It's three, you know, three and one, okay? Um, but, you know, that's not that weird because Satan's always trying to counterfeit the Lord. All right, let's talk about building cities a little bit. You ready? I thought this was interesting, man. I'm just sitting here studying, and the Lord's showing me things. I hope I do a good job to help you follow along with me. Building cities. You know how I've told you before that there's uh, so many different themes in the Bible, you know? What are you talking about? Okay. I'll, wear, I'll give you another one that I don't wear you out with. That I learned from more. The seed in the sacrifice. Right? It, 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 the, the sacrifice in the garden was for the first couple. The sacrifice at the Passover was for a family. The sacrifice on the Day of Atonement was for the nation. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. A sacrifice for the entirety of the world's sin. That's just one thing. There's... There's things about the garments of righteousness. There's things about the love of God. There's so many things that you can just take it. It's like a string that runs the course of the whole of the word. Amen. And you can just, and you can find it. There's the presence of God. There's a theme of the presence of God. He was with them. He was separated from them. Then he's working his way back. It's a theme. It's throughout the scripture. There's a theme about building cities. Not just any kind of city. The city of the enemy. There's a theme about a city, and it's an alternate building of a city that's different than the city of God. Here we go. Y'all ready? Look, look at this. Building a city, going up. See, man is building a city, and man is trying to build his city upwards so that he can try to get to God. All right? And what city is he building? He's building a city, and you're going to see it. It's called Babylon. Right? We know that. We know that story. That story about Babel is very powerful. It's, it's really, it's the spirit of humanism. I got that somewhere in here. It's kind of interesting because somebody said something about humanism in, in the room when we were talking earlier. This the spirit of Babel, and I've shared this with you before, it's man helping man, but it's outside of God. It looks good. It looks good to the human eye. And even Jesus said, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, you visited me in jail. We're supposed to do all that stuff. But guess what? The Buddhists do some of that. And the church has cloaked itself in good works. And it has left out the word of the living God to tell people the truth about Jesus. To tell people the truth about sin. And, and, and when we're scared 
to speak the truth anymore. And so what we say is we're, we're going to solve this and we're going to do that and, and we're going to reach more people that way. And guess what ends up happening? We end up with buildings full of people that they ain't even saved. That's what's happening. I'm going to tell you that right now. We end up with people, buildings full of people that aren't even saved. So man is trying to build a city with his own hands that reaches up to heaven. And listen, we don't even have time to talk about all the occult connections to the Tower of Babel and how if we understood the biblical worldview, like y'all reading that book, man, if we understood the biblical worldview and how the biblical writers understood the world that they lived in and all the occult religions and demonic stuff. And, you know, I was thinking about this because I was going to talk about it when we have that little class that we're going to have on June the 12th if you've been reading your book. You know what's so difficult is that we are so far removed from the Bible. When Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 walked down the dusty road where he lived, guess what? He could see the Tower of Babel. <laughs> it was right there. Alexander the Great, which was hundreds of years later, thousands of years later, wrote about the Tower of Babel. You just got to do your research if you can. And, and so what I'm trying to say is, is that these things were there. The ancient biblical writers knew these things were there. But we live in the midst of a society and in a church world where it's kind of like, out of town. The Bible's weird. Let's stay away from that. The Lord put it in his word. All right. Look, but God's building a city and it's coming down, my friend. See, Jesus told Philip, he said, I go away to my father's house. In my father's house, there's many mansions. If it were not so, I would not tell you. And he's going, to, I'm going to prepare a place for you. He's building the new Jerusalem, my friend. He's building the new Jerusalem. He's building a city that's four square that will descend from heaven to this earth. Amen. And man is trying to build up to get to God. God's building up there and he's going to bring it down. Amen. Everything that God gives is good. Amen. All right. So chapter 18 is about building Babylon, but specifically financial Babylon. Now here we get into the weird stuff. This man right here is Meyer Amschal Rothschild. Very weird. Most of y'all have already, you know, are aware of it. Why am I bringing this? Because I'm talking about financial Babylon. I'm trying to tell you that the city Babylon has already been here. I'm trying to tell you that this stuff is already on the earth. If you even dare to start clicking on some stuff and buying some books, you, your whole world view is going to be crushed in a moment of time, but it's okay because guess what? Jesus is still on the throne, my friend. Amen. But it's good to know what you're really dealing with. Amen? Right. So that you're not caught up in this little peripheral thing and that you start to see the big picture of God and you realize there's a great rebellion against God and God believed in you enough to, to give you the gospel so that you can hear the good news and be saved and then he wants to put you it's kind of like my dad used to say, when I know I've told y'all that before. Boy, don't let me see you sitting on that bench. You better, if the football coach doesn't want to put you in the game, you need to bug him and bug him until he puts you in the game. And then once you get in there, you better make something happen. I, all I'm trying to say is, is that the Lord doesn't keep us on the bench. And sometimes we go in the waiting room for a little bit. But he really he, he wants to prepare us to put us in the game, so to speak. He wants us to be able to be used by him in part of what he's doing. All right, so... You know what's interesting about this guy here? He had five sons, and they all ended up going to different parts of Europe. This was back in, the, I could be wrong with my numbers. I, I didn't really pay that much attention, but back in the like, late 1700s, probably after the French Revolution, the first bank they took over was the Bank of England. You understand England doesn't even own their bank? Do you realize I put Federal Reserve right here? Because I want you to understand the United States of America does not own That's right. All you got to do is a little bit of research in this study. Okay, so the, why did I put this? Because the whole chapter that we read was talking about merchants and wealth and commerce. And look, this Federal Reserve, th th this, th this is what this man said, okay? He, this is what he said. Rothschild said, give me control of a nation's money supply, and I care not who makes these laws. What are you trying to say, preacher? I'm trying to say financial Babylon is here. It's been here. The credit markets have been broken. People are dead slaves. With manipulation of saying the Fed's going to raise inflation, the stock market drops. And it's, it's already here. They manipulate money. They, they manipulate the financial system. It's not like there's going to be some new financial system other than the mark of the beast before all this stuff comes into play. It's already here. And I just want you to see that. Whether you agree with me 
on everything. It's okay. I just want you to see this stuff is already here. All right? And so this was The Economist, uh, September 29th, 2012, quoted Meyer Amschel Rothschild. And the Rothschild family lived, they're still alive. Like, Google them when you go home. Put, I'll tell you what you do if you care. If you don't care, if you don't want to get rid of it, don't Google. But Google, I tell you what, Google uh, Rothschild woman and her satanic goat head necklace. Now you go Google that. What, what is the point that you're trying to make? The point that I'm trying to make is there's so much information that shows these people are Luciferians, devil worshippers. Now we're making a really weird connection. See, it was one thing when there was just a greedy man that knew how to count coin and took over the banking industry. But now when we add to it that there's so much evidence, like I'm talking about books that were written in the 1700s that I have on my bookshelf in there, that show the evidences that were found that proved that this was taking place even way back then and it's been hidden under the radar and now when you connect this, what I'm trying to talk to you about credit markets and, and, and how he, they created all of this and the things that we see today and then you add to it, these people worship the devil, now we got, now we're getting somewhere where we can maybe understand what we're trying to say or we're just trying to tell you it's already here is what I'm trying to say and this is part of financial value. So when you say these things to people that can't see from this kind of a biblical worldview. See, it's not, it doesn't seem crazy to me. Right. That Satan, see, look, Robert used to say it all the time. Satan brought Jesus up on a mountaintop and he showed him the kingdoms of the earth. And he said, All you gotta do is bow to me and I will give you these things. And then Robert used to say, What does that mean to you? Right? What does that mean to you, dude? That's like, come on. What does that mean? Jesus told him, rebuke him. How many men do you think took him up on it? I mean, did he really? Did Satan really have the power to do such a thing? Or is that just, is that even real? Or was that just a little story that they threw up in the Bible? It kind of like freaked us out. I mean, no, that's the word. That's the word of God. See, that's the world we're living in. But we, I'm just saying, we'd rather go to sleep, hire us a welder, weld well, our eyes closed. No, that's not going to work. That's not going to work in the world that we're living in post-COVID with all this weird stuff going on. Our eyes need to be open. We need to be awake. We need to understand that the time is getting short. Souls need to be one into the kingdom. Disciples need to be made. You and I are supposed to be workers in the field. Amen. So but when you talk to people about this and they can't see from this type of a biblical worldview, they think you're crazy. I know because I've seen them look at me. Because the modern mind is so pragmatic and logical. What are you saying? I should be logical? Come on, man. No. But but listen, God is spiritual. And so that we become in the modern church has become so so logical that they can't even see the spiritual. Right, right, right. And you cannot properly perceive this. But it's because they did not comprehend evil being so organized. They're freaked out. But listen, I know because I've already been through it. I've already been through it. Oh, that makes me feel weird to give Satan credit for whatever. Dude, Satan is like, he's, he's a defeated foe. Jesus has already defeated him. But if you think that he, he likes it whenever the church thinks he's like a little weenie and he ain't getting nothing done. He loves that. You think you don't like that? He's like, man, he's over there laughing. He's stroking his golden beard and he's laughing at the church. He's like, man, they think they got me whooped. And, 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 you know, oh, but the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. The, the gates of hell are going to prevail against God's work. God wins in the end. Amen. But how much martyr blood has been lost along the way? How many people have been deceived and lost their way along the way? That's the real world the history of the church. That's the real history of the church. People die all over the place from the gospel of Jesus Christ. But when you think of evil being so organized, they think it is ludicrous. I can't prove any of this, but I mean, you get, I'm not even trying to take away from the shooting. I say stuff that I'm just to the point now where I'm not trying to like, I'm not trying to be popular anymore. Because I'm just done. I wasn't popular in school, I'm not going to be popular now. Okay. <laughs> but when you see a school shooting like that, and then all of a sudden you have a rash of other shooting, how much of that is real? I can't prove it. But then all of a sudden we're immediately talking about the gun control thing all over again. What I'm trying to say is, is that I got a, look, I'll tell you right now, I got a handgun. I bought it legally. I, I got it, you know, I got a lot on the door, so you ain't going to get in fast. 
I, and, I got, and I got the gun under my mattress. Guess what? I ain't never once fired in there. Not once. I checked the other night just to make sure it was still under there. What I'm trying to say is, is that if I want to have a gun, I ought to be able to have a gun. The right to bear arms, Second Amendment, United States of America. That's right. But they want to take guns. Don't think they don't. I'm not trying. I'm not a, a servant of the NRA. I, I never paid dues to the NRA. I'm just trying to make a point. If they take the guns away, okay, because look, I ain't even recommending that you get in the streets and fight like that. The Lord has showed me that this war that's coming, son, See, back whenever this nation was first founded, I remember from history school, from history class, they said, they taught, they said, don't shoot till you see the white in their eyes. This war ain't going to be like that. This is, when this next thing happens, this is going to be the end, my friend. And you can go, the, the Bible said, Jesus said this, he said, in, in, in Matthew 24, he's talking about those that are going to be taken into captivity will be brought into captivity. Those that will die by the sword will be dying by the sword. And it, like if you still, if people are still around that love the Lord in those days, you either gonna get killed or you are gonna get thrown in prison. Period. Done deal. There ain't gonna be none of this other stuff. You may you might go out into the street and take a few of them out, and if you feel like that's what the Lord wants you to do, and whatever the case, if they come into your house, more power to you. You got a right to protect your property. But what I'm saying is, if it's the military coming, I don't even know why I'm getting off on all this. If the military up turning, and how you gonna take out? The SWAT dude. How are you going to take out the, the Navy? Uh, you know what I'm saying? I'm just trying to make a point. Militarily trained people. Or you in, you in military coming into your neighborhood shortly. Okay. Yes. Is it possible? Yep. Absolutely it's possible. I don't even watch the news no more. The audio told me the other night. Did you hear Biden is trying to turn our sovereignty? I, I didn't watch this. I don't know what she was trying to say. Trying to turn our sovereignty over to the WHO, the World Health Organization. I guess they mean like how COVID is going to be handled in the future. China's part of that. You know, she's saying what people, she's probably reading on that. I don't even know if that's all true. I haven't ferreted it out. I can care less. Because whatever happens is going to happen. I know what the Word of God says. I know who wins in the end. Amen. I just need the grace that I need to wake up tomorrow and to keep sharing Jesus with a lost and dying world until I got no more breath in my lungs. And if I do that, I'm going to hear something good from my master. Amen. But I can tell you that don't be surprised because they're working, they're cooking some stuff up, my friend. They're trying to take away the liberties and freedoms of American citizens. I can tell you that right now. They're trying to steal it. Right? And so look, we're talking about this one Babylon again. We're talking about this harlot. And this is, this is what the word says. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. You know, I like this. Look, you see all this stuff right here? All these fineries. You know, we talked about that. The fineries and the, uh, the, the nice things of life. You ever slept in, on silk sheets? Man, my sister Linda, she was all about that. Satin and silk and why go climb up in her bed when she wasn't. When she wasn't looking and she fuss at me. Get out of my bed. Silk, man, silk is so nice and soft. Look at it. But cinnamon, look at that bouncing up there. Cin you know, cinnamon used to be more more expensive than gold back in the game. You know, you know how hard it is to harvest cinnamon? It grows in certain trees in certain countries. And boy, when you find, back in them days, I'm just saying, you found something like cinnamon. Wow, that changed your life. I mean, they didn't have Tony Sachery's Creole seasoning <laughs> back in them days. You find some, you learn how to harvest cinnamon, man. You got something. And then there's a lot of work just to get a little bit. I mean, Robert knows about that cinnamon. He gets it in his coffee every morning. Right? And so, so you see all of these things. I'm trying to make a point. See, once you're in the city, it's hard to get out. The Lord said, come out of her, my people. But what I'm trying to say is that once you get in the city, it makes it hard to get out because she's offering all this stuff. Pearls and gold and ivory and marble and silk. And you get used to living a certain way and driving a certain car. And, and people get caught up in the mess of being in the city. So again, we're talking about right here, we're talking about the building of the city. Look at what Jesus said. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Now, well, the Lord's got something to say about this. You can't live up in this woman's city and think, like, what I'm talking about, what are you trying to say, Pastor? I can't go to work tomorrow. Mm, come on. I'm all about work. 
What, what are you trying to say, Pastor? I can't buy a new car. I can't put crown hold in my house. I can't get a leather couch. That's not what I'm trying to tell you. What I'm trying to tell you is if you get caught up in that mess, and it takes over, and it starts to jack with your head, and it starts to mess you up, and now you're so focused with the grind, and making more money, and buying your stuff, that you're not focused on the word, it starts to steal, the seed of the word becomes hindered, it doesn't grow, right, and you can't, it chokes the word, and, and you don't grow and thrive. Now I want you to, I'm talking to you about a city, look at this. Genesis 4.17. This is, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure this is the first time the word city is ever used in the Bible. Genesis is full of firsts. You know who Cain is, right? He's the first murderer. He killed his brother Abel, right? <coughs> Cain knew his wife. She conceived and bore Enoch. It's not the good one. It's another Enoch. When he built the <coughs> city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. All right? Just keep that in mind. Now look at this. Genesis 4, 27. Seth, also a son, was born, and he called his name Enosh. Look at this. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. And here we see the dichotomy of two cities. We see the dichotomy, one of the differences between two people groups. Now listen, I want to show you something, the building of a city. This is Cain. I want you to see this. Look, if you go back and you read Genesis 4, this is what you're going to see. Cain's people, this is what they're coming up with. Music. The first musicians, spoken of in the Bible, okay, and human wives are, are listed under Cain's lineage. Livestock, metallurgy, making farm tools and implements in order, what does all these things do? What do all these things do? I'm just saying, like, back in the gap before this, okay, and I know that scientists are going to have things... Oh, no, your timing's all wrong. I don't want to hear what you got to say, sir. You don't believe in my God. You don't believe in Jesus. You're a liar. The Bible's true. Period. Let every man be a liar. God is true. That's, that, I'm done. Okay? Because they can, they can fouye. That's a Cajun word. They can fouye with carbon-14 data. They can, they can cook the books, like my, yep. my boss says. They cook in the books. They make it the numbers look the way they want to look. Okay, you think they're going to tell you they got it? No. They're going to come up with every plan they can to make it look like, he, that, like it ain't real. But you know what's happening right here? See, music will solace your soul. I'm just saying, like, if you're in pain, people look into music, even if it's not godly music. They look into music because it'll calm their emotions. Livestock is a whole lot easier if you've got about five head of cattle out there to butcher a cow than it is to go kill a deer. And then if you don't know how to kill a deer, then you have to go call some dude over the head and take his meat from him. I'm just saying, like before this was happening, metallurgy to make farm implements, before you had to go gather. It was the hunter and gatherer time frame. You had to go pick berries. But now under Cain's lineage, see, they're building a city. I want you to see that. But Cain's people have God, not, he's not in their city. So I want you to see, the first city spoken of right here, at least, is having the descendants of Cain making life better. Now we fast forward to the end, pearls and cinnamon and purple clothing and, and linen garments and, and all of these niceties. And like I said, once you're in the city, it's hard to get out. The Lord said, come out from her, my people. Right? So I wanted you to see that this is the beginning of this city. What I'm saying, look, this is the people against God. I hope this isn't too abstract for you, but this is the beginning building of a city. Yes, this was a literal, physical, geographical city. But the concept here <coughs> is building a society. Just like the city that harlot of Babylon, I'm trying to tell you, that's a society that's been being built. Right? And here it is again. Look, but look, the whole thing behind it is humanness. It's all separate from God. The whole thing is the spirit of humanity. I didn't go there, I didn't turn to it, but you know, humanity wants to be like God. I'm telling you right now, if human beings have a problem, they want to be like God. That's from the fall. In the day that you eat thereof, you shall know and you shall be as gods. You shall be as gods. Elohim. Not the God. Gods. Now, your King James is going to say that. Gods. And in the, in the Strongs it says Elohim. Um, it's a long story. We won't get into that right now. But some of the other translations translate it as big G. But I think the right translation is little G. But anyway, humanism. 
And you see the building of this city along with humanity. Okay, now the next thing we see, again, is the Tower of Babel. You see there, we already talked about it. And we're building, uh, uh, you know, look, I, I'm just, I just kind of like did this right here. Look, so Cain City, then next is Babel, and finally at the end is Mystery Babylon. You see, and I'm trying to make a, make a point so that you can see this. That this has been going on in society. You can find this information in the Bible. And so the last one is, is that it's kind of like, it brings, look, I know I'm always picking on Led Zeppelin, but it brings new meaning to the song, Stairway to Heaven. You see that? It really, and, and that's really what the song is about. If, you want, if anybody wants to know the truth, all that glitters is gold. No, it's not. Highway glitters and it's fool's gold. So that's not even true. Okay, and so what I'm trying to say, though, is this, is that they're building a stairway to heaven. That goes back to the Tower of Babel. They're building with their own hands and their own human spirit a society separate from God. That's what this harlot, the spirit of harlotry, the spirit of Jezebel, the spirit of Babel has been building, right? So let's look at Revelation 18, 23. In the light of the Lamb will shine in you no more. The voice of bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants were the great ones of the earth, and all nations were deceived by your sorcery. We're about to close, but I wanted to just point this out. You know, I kind of got choked up when I was reading, because whenever I was studying this, I realized, you know, because there's another spot in Revelation where it says, the spirit and the bride say come. Y'all remember that? If you go all the way back to the Old Testament, there's a beautiful type of that, where, where Abraham tells his servant Eleazar to go find a bride for Isaac the son. Dude, I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. When it comes to foreshadows and typology of God the Father sending his son to fetch a, and, and sending the spirit to fetch a bride for the son, it, it just doesn't get any better than that. In the time frame of Abraham, 2000 BC. And from those times that God is creating, the spirit of the bride says, Come. What, what does that mean? That means the Holy Spirit is saying to those that would make themselves the bride of Christ, Come. Come and drink of the waters of life freely. God's not charging anybody. You see? And it's the, it's the word of the gospel, it's the truth. And what I was trying to say earlier, what, what's so sad about is that there's coming a day when it stops. There's coming a day when the spirit and the bride will no longer be saying, come, because Babylon the Great will be destroyed. And so, uh, look, the nations of, of the earth and all nations were deceived by your sorcery. Now, this is a, this is a painting, all right? My mom tried to make me take art classes, but I just wasn't the way my brain worked. But my mom was a great artist for a period of time. I still got some of her artwork in my house. The reason that I chose this was for a reason. My, mom, my mom's type of painting was abstract. This is abstract art. This is probably one of my favorite uh, artists. Did anybody know who that is? Monet. 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 And uh, y'all probably don't shout out what it is. Y'all already know. I mean, some people you may be able to tell. But see, that's what abstract means. It's kind of hard to tell for sure what the painting is. But, and that's kind of like sometimes the Bible. The Bible is little pieces that come together to make a whole, right? This story that we just talked about in Revelation 17 and 18, there's little pieces and clues that help us to see a whole, right? And so the more you add to it, the more you might be able to start to figure out. Because see, this was Claude Monet. He was a French Impressionist. He was going blind. And, but, but his painting, he's very famous, and, and, his, and his, I love it because I love the colors that he uses. And, and he was, so he was an impressionist artist, right? So the more I keep adding to it, though, you're going to start seeing a little bit better what it is, right? It's, it's, it's famous for painting water lilies. But even more so, the more you add, you start to see more and more. This is actually what you call the Gardens of Giverny, where he lived in France, and he would do these paintings. And so now you can kind of see, oh, he's out in his yard. He's painting. What is my point? I'm going to tell you what my point is. Because 
abstractly, as you begin to put the pieces of the puzzle together, you begin to see who this harlot is. You begin to understand this city a little bit better. So upon this is some of the clues that we learned in the last couple of chapters about this harlot woman. And it says, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. We've already talked about the fact that she is false religion, but I'm just telling you, no, she's Satan's magic. She's the mother of producing false religion, false doctrine, any abomination that would pull people away from the true Christ, any kind of abomination, any kind of way that they can pull people away from Jesus. You name it, they thought of it. Alright? And so that's what she is. But she's also over People, the waters which you saw where the horse sits are people, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Dude, there's so much power in the fact that at the Tower of Babel, the people's languages were confused. And on the day of Pentecost, they began to speak in other tongues and the people heard them. And the fact that God is creating a family. Thank God for people that go to Kenya. Thank God for Brother God is going to Mexico. Amen. Listen. God's all about a family. He's got a big old family, my friend, and we all going to look a whole lot different. So if you got a color problem with people, the color of people's skins, or you got a problem with different cultures, you got a problem because God is going to have a problem with you because His family is it's going to be beautiful, man. I'm telling you. Remember that time I preached that message where I had them different grass and that tree had all them different kind of fruits on. It. You know, that's what it's going to look like. People, multitudes, nations, and tongues. But I want you to see the reverse of this. This is the influence that she had. So what is this saying? This ain't just some little geographical city. I'm trying to make a point to you. Because they got some people that you probably respect a whole lot more than me that are going to tell you this is a geographical location. I'm trying to tell you, this ain't one little geographical city. This is over the whole world. She has had influence over the whole world. All right? So, so she's Satan's magic. Okay, she's influencing the whole world. She's brought the whole world under deception. She is that great city. So here you go. She's the mother of harlots. That's Satan's magic. She, people, tongues, and nations. Her influence is over the whole world. This city is mystery Babylon. I hope you can see it. It's still an abstract picture. It's not that easy to see. But I want you to know that this thing is exist. You're living in the midst of it. The deception that is going on in the world right now. Listen, whether, whatever you believe about the coronavirus, do, can we all agree that there's been some deception connected to this? Yes. I mean, anybody that's got half a brain doesn't figure that out. Okay. Why? <laughs> Why are they? I had a lady at the pediatric clinic the other day, and she's sitting here, and she's <clears throat> saying all these things. Oh, what, you know, they're doing this to the shots, and they're doing that. Okay, I'm not here to argue with you. But even if all that's true, why? Population control. They want to kill people. Why? Why is it because people are just so powerful that they want to kill other people so that they can suck up all the resources? I mean, if it's true, why? Because it's bigger than just sucking up the resources, my friend. It's because they work for the devil. <laughs> they work for the devil, and this is the plan that the enemy has, and God is allowing it to take place. Why would God allow such a thing to take place? Because Daniel said it. Whatever is written will come to pass. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word, oh Lord God. I know that this is... It's, it's deep, oh Lord God, and I just pray, Lord, for each and every one of us in this house, Lord God, that you would help us, Lord God, to be able to discern the times that we live in, Lord, that we would be awakened from any sleep or slumber that any of us may have, that we would understand. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would put on the inside of our hearts the desire to see souls one into the kingdom, oh Lord God, that we would see that there's an ancient rebellion against you, even before you formed a man out of the dust of the the clay of the earth, O oh Lord, there was already a rebellion against you. Now the liar has caused your prized creation to also be in rebellion against you, O oh Lord. But you loved us enough to send your precious only begotten Son. Why that you would send him upon this earth to die on the cross for our sin so that we could have a relationship with you, so that we could see your beauty and understand your word, and so that
that we would be able to see the world for what it really is, oh Lord God, through the lens that you have given us, which is your word, oh Lord. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be able to understand better what we're, what we're living within, Lord, what you're calling us to do. Lord, and I pray that your anointing would be with us, Lord, that you would help us as individuals, as a church, Lord, as a, as a group of people, Lord, to do your work upon this earth, Lord. We're asking you, Lord, to water the seeds that have been planted, to send seed, seed sowers into the field. Lord God, we know that you are the Lord of the harvest. We know that you will produce a harvest of souls upon this earth. I pray that you would use us, Lord God, use your people, called by your name, every true believer upon this earth, Lord, use us, fill us with your spirit. Give us the strength that we need. Give us eyes to be able to see, Lord, in the midst of this deception and darkness, Lord God. Lord, I pray that the spirit and the bride, Lord, I thank God you're still here. You're still speaking and pleading. You are the woman of wisdom in Proverbs 8. You stand at the gate and you call to the simple and you say, come in here. Come in here and receive the word of truth that will set you free. Father, in the name of Jesus, maybe you're watching tonight. You Maybe you watched the video or you'll watch it. Then you would say, I've already seen what you're talking about. I can see the deception. There's many people out there. I just want to talk to you for a second. There's many people out there that already see all this deception. And, and, and you see all these other things going on. You know, people call it the Illuminati, whatever you want to call it. But why? you got to ask yourself the question, why? Why is this going on? And I'm here to tell you, it's deception to pull you away from Jesus. You need to invite Jesus Christ into your heart. You need to repent of your sin. And the Holy Spirit will come and live on the inside of you. And he will give you a new life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.